Okay, welcome to our question and answer session for the month of October. You can begin the quest the first question. Today twenty-eight questions. Question number one from Malaysia from B E Ong. How to practice equanimity and mindfulness? You need mindfulness to have equanimity. Equanimity arises when your mind enters into the fourth jhana. In in order for the mind to enter into the fourth jhana, you need mindfulness to keep the mind from thinking. You have to stop your mind from thinking. So you need mindfulness to force your mind to focus on one particular object, any object that can concentrate. Your mind, such as the breathing, or if you're not sitting, then you have to concentrate on watching your body. Question number two. Oh wait, you're not finished yet. Sorry. If you cannot use your body, you cannot focus on your body. You can use a mantra. You can recite Bhutto, Bhutto, Bhutto. The goal is to stop your mind from thinking aimlessly. If you have putto, or if you keep watching your body, focus on your body, then your mind cannot go elsewhere. Then, when then you will have mindfulness this way. Once you have mindfulness, when you sit and meditate, focus on your breath. Eventually, the mind will become calm and peaceful, enter into the fourth jhana. Then you will have equanimity from. That state of mind. The longer you stay in that state of state of calm, the the stronger will you be equanimity after you withdraw from that state. Okay. Question number two: When listening to your teaching and answering the questions, everything looks very sensible and everything is very simple. I wonder whether during your practice and training, you have to face difficulties. And some period of time where things were not going well, and things did not look so simple. Could you think of any specific examples and share with us how did you face those difficult times? Well, the difficult times come when you lack mindfulness, when you forget to uh, control your thought, you let your thought run wild. When you start to think, imagining. All sorts of cravings and desire will start to come up, and if you let it keep on going, then it will create very, very bad feeling inside yourself, to the point where if you're not strong enough, you might have to succumb to your cravings and feelings, and your desire. Then you know that you are going backward, not going forward. But if you know that. You are losing mindfulness, and you try to bring back your mindfulness by either reciting Bhutto, 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 or keep focusing on your body, keep watching what you are doing, or go sit down and watch your breath. Then, gradually, it will come back to normal, come back to calm, and your. Uh, Your craving and your desire will subside, and you will feel not more or less normal. So this is the the difficulty that is to maintain mindfulness all the time. Sooner or later, you will forget to be mindful. As soon as, as soon as you becoming unmindful, your craving and your desire will start to arise, and then all the emotional Feelings will arise, and then if you cannot uh, get it back down, then you might have to do what your your craving or your desire asks you to do. So this is a matter of uh, going back and forth, yeah. depend on the strength of your mindfulness. Sometimes you walk three or four step ahead, then sometimes you walk back two or three steps. Yeah. So, but as long as you understand that this is the process of practice, that you cannot always win, you cannot always go forward. 
Sometimes you fall, sometimes you walk backward. So what? You know, just as long as you keep on pushing yourself, uh, don't give up. You, know. you might lose this round, but if you don't give up, you will win the next round. So just keep on going. Keep maintaining mindfulness and keep contemplating on anijang tukkhang anatta. This will help you to push yourself forward. Question number three. Did you have any long period of regression in your practice and feeling of dissatisfaction? No, not really. Uh, maybe just briefly. And as soon as you, you realize that you lose mindfulness, then you just bring back your mindfulness, keep focusing your mind on something. Then, then you'll come back to normal. Mm. Question number four. More than 15 years ago, a few days after I started practicing meditation for the first time, I experienced an enormous well-being of deep samadhi. I managed to repeat that experience a few times even when I was not meditating. This lasted for a couple of months. After that, I lost it. I started pursuing the gratification of sensual pleasure. Until many years later, after reading some sutta and getting advice from meditation teacher, I learned more about what I had had experience. Now I have been practicing hard for many years to foster back my mindfulness, but I still can't get into that deep samadhi again. Why was it so easy to get into samadhi when I first started and when I almost did not make any effort to do it, but it is now so difficult to get into samadhi when I put a big effort in practicing? Would you have any advice? Yes, the thing that blocks you from uh, attaining to samadhi is your desire to get into samadhi. So instead of focusing on your meditation object, you keep thinking about when am I going to get this samadhi again. So you have to forget this samadhi that you had acquired in the past. And it's like the first time when you practiced, you didn't know what samadhi was about. So you didn't think anything about samadhi. All you did was concentrating on your meditation object. So it was easy for you to enter into samadhi. But once you have samadhi and know what it was like and you want to get back, then this thought will keep coming up when you doing doing meditation. Instead of focusing on your breath, you keep thinking, when, it, when, it, when will the mind become calm? When will the mind be like what it used to be? So this is the obstacle that blocks your progress. So you have to forget about the past. The past is already gone. You can never bring it back. You can only bring it. You can only create a new experience by focusing on your mindfulness only, and stop thinking about the past or the future. The past is the samadhi you already had. The future is the 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 new samadhi that you're gonna get. If you keep thinking about the past and the future, you will not be in the present. And if your mind is not in the present, your mind cannot enter into samadhi. Question number five from Kelvin Lee from Malaysia. I meditate by focusing on my breath, but sometimes my mind switches to an object that arises, then insight arises. For example, I think that fabrication are impermanent. Then I feel calm. After that, I go back to focus on my breath, but I find that my mind wanting to go back into doing inside meditation. So, when do I stop focusing on my breath? Well, you have to first know what you are doing. If you are developing samadhi, then you should forget about inside meditation. Because if you, if you don't, then you will be distracted by your desire to do inside meditation. And your inside meditation will be fruitless because you don't have enough strength to apply the the right uh, the the strength to suppress your defilement. You need samadhi first before you can go into inside meditation. You need the strength of samadhi to help you suppress the the, the defilement. So when you're developing samadhi, try to ignore the, the urge or the desire to go into inside meditation. 
because you're skipping the 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 process. You're going ahead without having the proper prerequisite to support your 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 work. Yeah. Inside meditation, need a mind with samadhi. A mind without samadhi cannot go into inside meditation successfully. You can develop, you can contemplate, but it will not have the strength to get rid of the defilements. You can only get rid of the defilement when you already have samadhi. So when you do samadhi, just focus on your object of meditation. Don't don't switch, don't change. Don't don't switch in the middle of the race, like race horse. When you race horse, you stick with your own one horse. Don't keep changing horses. You know. So when you are contemplating on your meditation object, just keep focusing on that object only. Anything comes up, just ignore. Don't pay attention. Don't be distracted. If you can do this, then eventually all the distraction will disappear and your mind will enter into jhana and will have equanimity, the strength to be to suppress your defilement. Once you have developed strong samadhi, then the next step you can go into inside meditation. You can contemplate on asupa, contemplate on anicca, contemplate on anatta, contemplate on dukkha. If you see these things truly as anicca, dukkha, anatta, as asupa, then you will not want to have them. You know that your desire for them will will be harmful to you. Question number six. When I meditate, meditating and get into more subtle states of concentration, if suddenly there is a loud sound, I feel very shocked. I will not feel as shocked as when I am not meditating. Is this normal? And how should I continue to meditate after I feel the shock? Yeah, it's normal. When the mind has to be imp- impacted by something uh, sudden and, 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 and strong, the mind will react automatically. This is not a problem. The problem is, is once the shock disappears, does the mind still remain fearful? If that's fearful, then this is not this is defilement. It's not the nature of the mind. So you have to get rid of that fear. Just uh, contemplating on anicjang tukang anatta by thinking that the the thing that caused you and mind to shock is come and go. It came and went and could not hurt you. So don't be afraid of it. Be ready to to face it again when it comes up. So this way, then you will not be afraid. Yeah. But if you're not afraid, you just realize that the mind just becomes shocked because of something that come impact the mind. And once it is gone, then everything comes back to normal. Then you don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Question number seven from TOWT, Malaysia. Ajahn explained that Samatha and Vipassana cannot go together as they are different level of meditation. So when should we learn vipassana meditation? Is there any time frame as a reference when to do it? When you have graduated from samadhi, like when you have to graduate from bachelor degree before you can go into your master degree. If you haven't yet finished your gra- your bachelor degree, you cannot go into your master degree program. So if you haven't mastered the fourth jhana then you cannot go into vipassana successfully. No, nothing can stop you. If you want to go into vipassana now, you can do it. But it just not will, will not be successful at all if you don't have the fourth jhana to support you. So you need to have the fourth jhana. And the fourth jhana, fourth jhana has to be permanent in the sense that you can always enter into the fourth jhana. Not just once you can enter into fourth jhana and then you can then you go start on your inside meditation because it's still not strong enough. You need to have strong fourth jhana that you can always rely on any time. You can want to rest your mind, you can always go into the fourth jhana. Then with that then you can be ready to go into the battle of with the defilement. 
by using inside meditation to get rid of your defilement. Question number eight. During meditation, my breath becomes subtle, but my mind will not stay still for a long time. It will start thinking and slowly drop out of samadhi. How can I maintain my mind to continue to be in samadhi? Well, you just have to keep watching your, your breath. Don't let the thought distract you. Your thoughts still come up, but don't, don't pay attention to, to them. Keep watching your breath. Even if there's no breath to watch, then just keep watching the emptiness. As long as you don't go and, and go after your thought, then it's okay. Just ignore your thought. Stop your thought. Yeah. By just keep concentrating on your breath. With, if there's no breath, just keep concentrating on the emptiness. Yeah. Just stay with the emptiness. And then eventually your mind will converge and become uh, absorbed and be, then all your thoughts then will then disappear and your mind will be calm, peaceful and at ease and have equanimity. Question number nine. What should I do when I am in samadhi? Do nothing. You just you just enjoy it, that's it. Once you get into samadhi you'll find the 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 best form of happiness. Nothing is can be compared to the happiness that you get from when you enter into samadhi. Question number 10. I use mantra Buddha to help me going into meditation. I need about 15 to 20 minutes to let the breath become calm and subtle. Is it, is it normal? Yes, when your mind is still uh, restless, then you might need a mantra to calm it down. Once your mind becomes calm enough to be able to watch your breath, then you can switch to watching your breath. Question number 11 from Mei Yang Lo, Malaysia. I am now confused on how to practice meditation. In my recent Vipassana retreat, I reached a state of heightened calm and joy. I reported it to my, ma to my teacher and I was told that it's a state of samadhi, but I should not stay in that state. I was advised to come out of that state and look for other objects to anchor my mind. My question is, when I reach that state of samadhi, should I come out of it and do walking meditation? No, you only come out after your mind wants to come out. If your mind wants to stay in samadhi, don't force it out. Because this is the, the best state of mind for the mind, is to be in samadhi. Because when the mind is in samadhi, the mind is peaceful, calm, and happy. What you want to do is to keep it in there as long as possible. But once it no longer wants to stay in there, and then it comes out, then what you should do next is to continue on with your mindfulness. Because you don't, you are not have, uh, you, you are still not having the, the, the firm grip on your samadhi yet. So you need to practice more mindfulness and then go back into samadhi again. Do this back and forth until you become a uh, professional. You, are, you become able to do it anytime. When you want to enter to samadhi, you can go in there quickly. Five minutes, you can already in there. Every time you want, you always have it. Then the next step is to, when you come out of samadhi, then you can go on contemplating on anijang tukkang anatta, uh, contemplating on asupa, to teach your mind that things around you, things that you want, are bad for you, are dukkha, because they are anicca, they are anatta. Just keep teaching your mind until this knowledge be firmly embedded in your mind. Every time you want something, this knowledge will come up and tell you it's anijang dukkang anatta, it's a super. When and when this knowledge come up, then you say it's better. I better not want it. You know, then you can get rid of <coughs> of your desire, your craving that way. Question number twelve from Iv Louis. I am confused because I have been practicing for three years, but nothing happens. I listen to other Ajahn's talk who said that when I feel restless. I should contemplate on the air coming in from my skull, flowing through my whole body and flow out. 
to my feet. Now I just focus the air at the tip of my nose. But there are still many thoughts in my mind and I'm still very restless. So I feel like changing to another method. Please advise. It's not the method that you lack. What you lack is continuous mindfulness. So what you have to do, you have to develop mindfulness all the time first. And from the time you get up, you have to start developing mindfulness right away. You can do this along with what you have to do in your, your life. Like when, you op- when you open up your eyes, you can start butto, butto, butto. Or you can start watching your body, the position of your body, lying down, getting up, sitting, standing, walking, going to the bathroom, wash it, washing your face, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, dressing. Just keep staying with all these activities. Don't let your mind think about other things. Then you will have slowly you will start to have continuous mindfulness. When you have your, once your mindfulness becomes continuous, when you sit and watch your breath, then your mind won't go away. Your mind will keep watching the breath. And if you stay with the breath continuously, then your mind will enter into samadhi very easily and quickly. Question number 13 from Canada. My father has passed away and his will he left for and in his will, he left more of his asset to my children and me than to another sibling. One of my siblings is contesting the will and has hired a fancy and expensive lawyer to prove that more assets are meant for her. I'm thinking of just expressing my point of view but not hiring a lawyer to fight my case. It will mean that my children and I will most likely get much less but I'm thinking it's better to be poorer than to be fighting with my sibling. Is this the correct way of thinking? I think so. It's better to uh, to have metta than to have money. Loving kindness, metta is much more precious than having money. Because once you have metta, you'll be loved by everyone. Once you have money, you'll be hated by everyone. So it's up to you what you want. <laughs> Question number 14. The school where I work is used to having a fancy choir where students can sing for free provided by music teacher. I wanted to drop the choir so that I could have more time to meditate. But now many parents are angry with me as they want me to continue with the choir. Is it best to do what they want or to continue with my plan to stop the choir? And what should I tell them so that they will not be upset? Well, it's your life, isn't it? You want to live your life or you want to live their life? <laughs> if you want to live their life, you t- follow what they tell you to do. If you want to live your life, then you do what you think is best for you. <laughs> Question number 15 from Ankus Bhagat, India. What do we see when we enter to Sota Panamaka? You don't see nothing. <laughs> you just get rid of your attachment to your body by studying the nature of the body. When you see that the body isn't you, then you then can let go of your attachment. Once you have let go of your attachment, then you will not be afraid if the body should get old, get sick or die. That's what happens when you become a sotapanna. You no longer attached to the body. You no longer afraid of getting old, getting sick or die. Question number 16. Does seeing non-self mean seeing sunyata or emptiness? No, non-self means there's no self in anything. Is there a self in your iPhone? No, right? Is there a self in your car? No. Is there a self in your body? You say yes, but that's delusion. In the truth is the same. There is no self in the f- car, there is no self in the iPhone, so there is no self in this body. They are the same thing, they are made up of material. Uh, they are made from the four elements. The mind is just, beca- the, mind just the possessor of these objects. You own the iPhone, you own the body. Yeah. But the body is not you, the iPhone is not you, the car is not you. 
You just own it temporarily. Sooner or later, you have to give them all up. Question number 17 from Joel Pua, Malaysia. Upon death, are we able to realize that our mind is separate from the body? Upon death is like when you go to sleep. Yeah. You don't realize anything when you go to sleep. You enter into the dreamland. You go into the dreamland, into the dream world. Same way with death. When you die, you enter into the dreamland, dream world. Until you get a new body, then you awake again. So death is just uh, death is just a process of changing a new body. This the old body that you have can no longer live, cannot go on. So it stop stop breathing. So when you cannot use this body, then you go into a dreamland, waiting for a new body. When there's a new body, then you wake up again with the new body. Yeah. Question number 18. On what basis does rebirth take place? And do we have control over the rebirth? Rebirth is caused by your craving and your desire. If you still have craving and desire for things in this world, you will keep coming back and reborn so that you can come back and acquire the things that you want. If you don't want to be reborn, you have to stop all your cravings and your desire for things in this world. Once you no longer have any craving or desire for things in this world, then you won't have to come back again. In order to stop your craving, you have to practice morality, meditation, and inside meditation. Do we have control over the rebirth? Yes, you can stop your rebirth by stop your cravings and your desire. If you want your rebirth to be a good rebirth, then keep doing good things. Avoid doing bad things. Then your rebirth will be rebo reborn in a better state. Had much better happiness. But if you keep doing bad things and you don't do good things, then your rebirth will be bad, re bad rebirth. You'll be born as an animal. You'll be born as a bad person. This is how you can control your rebirth. By your action, by your karma. Keep doing good karma. Stop doing bad karma. And if you don't want to re reborn, then you have to get rid of all your defilements. Question number 19. Is Nibbana a state of bliss where the mind is bright and pure? State of Nibbana is a state when the mind has completely eliminated all the defilements. Once the defilement is, is de eliminated, then the mind becomes peaceful and happy. Yeah. Question number 20. When one has attained Nibbana, is he or he, is he or she only emanating positive things? No. When you, once you reach Nibbana, you eliminate rebirth. You don't have to be reborn again. Question number 21. As we don't know how much negative karma we have accumulated in the past, do we need to pay them all back before we can reach Nibbana? This thing, they come automatically. You don't have to worry. When they send you the bill, you just pay it. That's all. When they don't send you the bill, then just don't worry about it. Question number 22. I understand that learning a musical instrument or learning to sing can help one learn good disciplines such as tenacity, being focused and being humble. There are some very beautiful universal qualities to the music and music making, although I am not attached to them. In this respect, is music making and learning about music a hindrance to a spiritual path? Well, it is and it, and it is not. It depends on how you look at it. It, is, uh, it can enhance your spiritual path because learning music, you need to have, read, have discipline, you have to have mindfulness, yeah. but if you are content with just doing this thing, then you will it will become a hindrance. But if you use it as a tool to develop mindfulness and develop discipline, then it it can help and can can support your spiritual practice. 
So you, you can use this as a step forward. Yeah. Once you have discipline, once you have mindfulness, then you switch your object of mindfulness from the music to the practice of meditation. Yeah. Question number 23. In one of Ajahn's talk, Ajahn mentioned that fleas on the head are considered as beings which have sense of consciousness and killing them would be considered as broken a precept. In this case, how should we get rid of the fleas? Well, you just wash it, wash it, or shave your head. You know. Shave your head, then you don't kill it. You know. Just shave your head. Yeah. Question number 24. What is astral travel? Huh? Astral, I think out of body experience, something like that. Uh, psychic experience. This is something that you do when you meditate. You pull the mind from the mundane experience. The mundane is the body experience, the physical experience. Then you enter into the psychic world when you meditate. So when you meditate, there are two places you can go the, into, in the psychic world. One is the, the inactive psychic world in which you remain calm and peaceful. Uh, you can go into the active psychic world in which you get engaged with psychic beings. You can get involved with all the uh, psychic experiences. But for most people, when they meditate, they go into the inactive psychic world. They go into calm and peaceful state of mind. But for some, f some few people, they might be able to go to the active psychic world in which they can get into contact with other spiritual beings. Question number 25. I had an experience in one evening when I lied down to rest, I clearly felt that my soul was leaving my physical body. During that time, I met someone whom I, I identified as a loving spiritual guide. The image of five Dayani Buddha flashed before my mind's eye. Then I was told I was in Sampala, a plane that resides in us. Could Ajahn help me to understand what kind of experience is this? And is there any significance to this experience? They're just uh, what you call m mental experience, like dreams. Yeah. So you can, if you can use it to your benefit, then use it. If you cannot or you don't know how to use it, then just forget about it. Don't, don't worry. Don't, don't let it bother you. Just treat it as anijang tukang anatta. Question number 26. When my mind floats out of physical body, I am often able to command a certain chant consciously and I can also command the mind to return. There was one time the Namo Amitabha came via, via a subconscious mind and the vision was clear. Can I understand what is this? Well, it's just your mind doing things, playing tricks, showing you different tricks the mind can do, that's all. It has no real value in terms of getting rid of your defilements. So don't get engrossed or be excited about it. Just treat it just like another experience. Your goal is to want to be able to get rid of your defilements. So anything that doesn't support this, then don't worry about it. Forget about it. Better. Question number 27. I have learned the teaching of the Pure Land where it says that based on certain practice of Chan, one can transport it first to the Pure Land, a more conducive plane to further practice for the ultimate objective. Can Ajahn enlighten me on this matter? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know anything about this Pure Land. So I cannot. Last question from Lily Pierce. I understand that Buddhism do not believe in God as a creator, but believe in karma. Are there any similarity between Buddhism and other religions, such as the training of not killing, stealing, and love and compassion? Again, come again. I understand that Buddhism do not believe in God as creator, but believe in karma. Are there any similarity between Buddhism and other religions? Yes, yes on the on the morality level and on the charity level. 
every religion teaches the same thing. Teach people to be charitable, to be loving toward your neighbors, and to be have moral morality, not to hurt your your fellow human beings or animals. These are the same teaching, but the difference go higher when you go into meditation. Some religion teach you to meditate for calm. Uh, some religion teach you to meditate to go to see God, like when you sing praises. You, know, you en when you meditate, when your mind become calm, you meet God. You know. But Buddhism teach further than that. Once your mind is calm, Buddhism teach you to use this mind to to get rid of the defilements which causes the mind to be reborn again and again. This is the only difference b with Buddhism as regard to other religion. Other religion don't teach the, the elimination of the defilement, don't teach the stopping of the rebirth. Uh, Sean Ross. Dear Ajahn, I have been suffering the mental illness, schizophrenia, for 12 years. I have tried everything but the only thing that stop it is medication. Even with this medication, it is difficult to meditate. Do I have to wait till the bad karma is finished? Well, you can use the Dhamma medicine to help kill your schizophrenia. And the medicine is mindfulness and wisdom or common sense. If you can develop mindfulness and have common sense or have the right kind of knowledge, the knowledge that will get rid of your defilement, the knowledge that will kill your your suffering, then you can you don't have to wait for your karma. You can be be cured, but you have to put a lot of effort in order to develop mindfulness strong enough to calm your mind. Need, need to take a lot of effort and continuous effort. You have to do it continuously from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep. You should not be without mindfulness. You should always be mindful with what you do, what you, uh, what you do with your body. Try to focus on just what you do. Don't let your mind go think about other things. If you can keep the mind in this way, then you, when you have time to meditate, you can calm your mind. Once your mind is calm, your mind will be rid of this suffering. So what you need is mindfulness. Focus on what you do, on your body activity, on your body movement. And when you can sit, then you focus on your breath. Watch your breath, in and out breath, at the, at the tip of your nose. And not let your mind go thinking about other things. If you can do this, then your mind will eventually become calm and peaceful and and happy, light, and have no any have no suffering inside your mind. But this will be a temporary state. After a while, your mind will withdraw and return to your body. And if you want to continue to protect your mind then you can either use more mindfulness, continue on with your mindfulness like before, or if you want to solve the problem in a permanent way, then you should learn to use wisdom or insight that the Buddha had discovered. The Buddha said, our problem arises from our desires or cravings. And the, the cravings that the things that we crave for is temporarily not permanent. It can give you a temporary happiness, and when it when it disappears, it will cause you sadness. 
So it's better not to go after anything in order to make you happy. If you want to be happy, it's better to go back to your meditation. If you can do this, then eventually your, your cravings or your desire that cause all your suffering will disappear. And then your illness will disappear and you will become normal again. Kun Chia, had the Buddha ever gave a sermon on ghosts in hell? If yes, who is listening? Give a sermon, sermon to the ghost? In hell. No, the, the Buddha can only give sermon to those who are in the heavenly, heavenly realms, the devatas, the devas, those who uh, have done a lot of good things when they are, li when they are alive. And after the body die, the mind or the spirit then will be in a heavenly realm. And these are the people that the Buddha gave sermon to. He gave sermon to this, this group of spirit every night. It is, it is part of his daily routine or duty. Stephen Morris. I have read a lot about observing the mind. How does this work when the mind is the, the observer? Well, the mind is both the observer and the, the, object, the object of observer. The mind is both subject and object. It's like the body. You look at the body. The body use the eyes to look at the body. So the body look at itself. The mind also can look at itself. Because inside the mind, there is things that is good and bad to the mind. If you don't observe, then you don't know. And you might, you might just let the bad thing uh, remain and cause you problem. But if you keep observing your mind, and if you see things that are bad for your mind, and if you find the right method, you can get rid of your, prob your the problem that caused the mind problem. Then you will not have any problem later on. But if you don't observe, then you would not know what is it that is making your mind sad or unhappy. But if you keep watching, then you will find out sooner or later. Because everything that happens has a cause. It doesn't happen all by itself. Yeah. It has to have something to cause it to happen. And according to the teaching of the Buddha, he said our, our sadness, our bad feelings are caused by our desires and our cravings. So if we don't want to have any bad feelings or, or sadness, then we must get rid of our cravings or sadness or our clinging attachment to things and people. Stephen, again, huh? would you observe the mind when you come out of Samadhi meditation, when your mind is calm? When you have mindfulness, you will eventually observe the mind all the time. From the time you get up to the time you go to sleep, you would never abandon watching your mind, observing your mind because your mind is the culprit of all your problems. So if you abandon, you're not observing it, then you're allowing the mind to go free and cause you a lot of problems. So you have to observe the mind all the time. But when you start, you're not, you don't have strong enough mindfulness to observe the mind yet. So you observe other things more easily, like your body, as, you, as the basis of your developing mindfulness. Once you have strong mindfulness, then you will be able to observe the mind. But when you cannot see the mind yet, then you have to watch the body, because the body is the extension of the mind. Whatever the body does, does so because the mind tell it to do. Tell it to do. So if you keep watching the body, you are uh, indirectly watching the mind, because the mind tells the body what to do. 
So you watch the body. Make sure that it doesn't do anything bad. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your questions. And if you want to ask any more questions, please do so. We'll be happy to answer them. Until then, good luck and good progress on your practice. Bye-bye. <laughs>